This video lecture is meant to cover the material in Chapter 7, Section 2, which is called Ionic Bonds and Ionic Compounds, and it's going to discuss how ionic bonds form as well as the physical properties of ionic bonds. I'm going to start by showing you an animation which shows sort of a schematic idea on the molecular level, on the atomic level, of what's happening when an ionic bond forms between a metal atom and a non-metal atom. Ionic bonding occurs between two atoms when one of the atoms has sufficient strength of attraction to remove an electron from the other atom. A sodium atom has one valence electron with a stable energy level below containing eight electrons. A chlorine atom has seven valence electrons. If the atoms collide with sufficient energy, the chlorine atom will remove the electron from the sodium. The sodium atom loses its only valence electron and becomes a positively charged sodium ion. The energy level below now provides sodium with its stable octet. The extra electron completes a stable octet for chlorine, which becomes a negatively charged chloride ion. We're going to pause that video because it goes into covalent bonds uh, right away, but we're going to leave that part of the video until the next unit. This next video I'm going to show you is the same reaction of sodium and chlorine, but I am going to show this to you, um, the actual chemical reaction of sodium and chlorine. Sodium and chlorine are examples of atoms that combine ionically. Sodium is a reactive, soft, silvery metal of low density. Its atoms have one valence electron. Chlorine is a corrosive, yellowish-green gas. Its atoms have seven valence electrons. When mixed, the two atoms combine explosively as an electron moves from each sodium to each chlorine atom. A closer look at the resulting product reveals the formation of small white sodium chloride particles also known as table salt. Water is an example of a com And that's where we're going to cut that video off because again it gets into, goes right into a covalent uh, example. But we wanted to focus on the ionic example where a metal gave its electron to, it, to the non-metal. So let's talk about that in a little bit more detail, put, help you wrap your head around the whole process. How ionic bonds form? Metals will easily lose their valence electrons to a nonmetal. In the video you just saw, sodium was the metal, gave its one valence electron to chlorine that had seven valence electrons. The result is the metal atom becomes a positively charged ion called a cation. The nonmetal atom becomes a negatively charged ion, which is an anion. And then the resulting two ions, the cation and the anion, are held together with what's called an electrostatic force of attraction. They're not physically connected, they are just attracted to one another, uh, much like uh, when you rub a balloon on your head or on your sweater and then the balloon sticks to a wall. Okay, that's an electrostatic attraction. Each ion is now stable. This is this octet rule which we talked about in the previous lesson. Uh, each ion now has a full valence shell of eight valence electrons. This website is a simulation of reacting different metals together with different nonmetals to see what is happening on the atomic level. So if we start with sodium and let's say fluorine, there's our metal, sodium, our nonmetal, it's fluorine. We're going to make a compound. We're going to see what happens here. The sodium gives its one electron to the fluorine. The sodium becomes positively charged. The fluorine becomes negatively charged. So there's a simple example of an ionic bond happening. Now this net positive ion can now be attracted to this negative ion. Let's try calcium with fluorine. This is going to be a little different because calcium has two electrons to give away but fluorine only needs one. So the question is, what is calcium going to do with that second electron? Let's see what happens. Uh, 
As you can see, the calcium had two electrons to give away, but each fluorine can only take one electron. So therefore, two fluorines are needed for every calcium that is in this reaction. Calcium ends up with a plus two charge because it gave away two electrons, and each fluorine takes on a negative one electron because each fluorine atom gained one negative electron. Let's see what happens when we put calcium together with oxygen. Calcium is going to give away its two electrons, but it turns out that oxygen has six valence electrons, so it needs two electrons. So in this case, calcium only needs one oxygen for both atoms to become stable ions. So Ca plus 2, O minus 2, calcium gave away two valence electrons, oxygen received two valence electrons. What happens when we react sodium with oxygen? Each sodium has only one valence electron to give away, but oxygen needs two. So in this instance, we're going to need two sodiums, each giving away one electron, for every one oxygen atom, which needs both of those electrons to be stable. So in this case, we'd have two sodiums for every oxygen. Now here we have aluminum. Aluminum has three valence electrons. Let's react that with fluorine. If aluminum is going to give away three electrons, it's going to need three fluorine atoms to receive all three of those electrons. The aluminum will become a plus three charge, and each fluorine will become a negative one charge. So the ratio here is for every one aluminum, there will be three fluorides needed. What happens if we react aluminum with oxygen? Here we have each aluminum giving away three electrons, but each oxygen can only receive two electrons. So watch carefully what's happening as I replay this animation over and over. Each oxygen receives two electrons. Each aluminum is giving away three electrons. So we're talking about a total of six electrons being donated by the aluminum, six electrons being received by the oxygen. But the ratio of aluminum to oxygen is two aluminum to every three oxygens. Properties of ionic compounds. We're going to talk about a couple of the physical properties of ionic compounds. The first being that ionic compounds are what we call crystalline solids at room temperature. They form this crystal lattice, this very rigid three-dimensional geometric structure. For sodium chloride, it ends up being a cubic structure, and you can actually see this if you were to look at salt, table salt crystals up close. They are miniature little cubes. Not all ionic compounds will have this cubic structure, but it is a very common one that is very easy for you to see next time you sprinkle salt on your french fries. A second property of ionic compounds is that they have a very high melting point. If we take a look at this um, schematic of an ionic compound, we see the negative ions surrounded by positive ions. And because there are so many of them in this array, um, there is an electrostatic attraction surrounding all of the ions. And while each ionic bond is not very strong, collectively that's a fairly strong glue holding all those ions together. So the high melting point what we need is the amount of energy it would take to, to separate these ions from the solid into the liquid form. It's going to take a fair amount of energy to do that because of the overall magnitude of all those ionic bonds. So here what we're seeing is as we go from the solid state to the liquid state, it takes a fair amount of energy to do that. So the resulting property is that it takes uh, it's a high melting point. The temperatures to make them melt are going to be pretty high. Sodium chloride melts at 1,474 degrees Fahrenheit or 801 degrees Celsius. It's pretty high. Another property of ionic compounds is they'll conduct electricity only when they're melted or when they're aqueous, but never when they're solid. 
it, to, it wanted to play all by itself here. Here we're going to take a look at this first video here. I'll make it bigger so you can see it. This is, we're going to take salt and we are going to melt it. Let's see if I can move this one out of the way. We're going to melt this and watch the light bulb hopefully glow. So there's a flame being applied to the bottom of this beaker where there is sodium chloride in there. And if you look carefully down here, you can see signs of melting. These are the electrodes. And as soon as these ions are free to move around, can, electricity can be conducted. And the result is that the light bulb will actually glow rather brightly when it, it gets into a good consistent liquid state. So ionic compounds will conduct electricity when they are molten, when they are melted. Ionic compounds will also conduct electricity when they are dissolved in water. It's a condition called aqueous, when they are aqueous and dissolved in water. We can see here that this is a container of deionized water. They've got some salt down here. It has kosher. I'm not sure why it had to be kosher salt. Here they're closing the circuit, showing you that no electricity is flowing, except when the electrodes touch. Then there's a complete circus and the light cir circus. There's a complete circuit, and the light comes on. When the circuit's broken, the water itself is not enough to conduct electricity. When the salt is dissolved in water, ions are free to move around. And when there are mobile ions, electricity can flow and we see the light bulb come on. So what we see here is that ions will conduct electricity so only when they are melted or when they are aqueous, but never when they are in the solid form. Okay, so what you see here is an ionic compound in the solid form and this cannot conduct electricity because these ions are too rigid and they can't flow. They can't allow electricity to flow. Right? So you have to have movement of ions in order for electricity to flow and that's what this video is going to show you a schematic of ions being mobile in water. Sodium chloride crystals are held together by attractive forces between the positively charged sodium and negatively charged chloride ions. When a crystal of sodium chloride is placed into water, the hydrogen ends of polar water molecules attract the negatively charged chloride ions and gradually surround them. Likewise, the oxygen ends of water molecules are attracted to and surround the positively charged sodium ions. The hydrated ions drift away into the solution, allowing new water molecules to surround newly exposed ions. Gradually, the entire crystal dissociates into solution. So there you have uh, properties of ionic compounds. Just to quickly review, we saw that um, ionic compounds are, they have a crystal lattice structure and they are solid at room temperature. They have a high melting point and that ionic compounds conduct electricity only when melted or when they are aqueous, and these videos are not behaving for me. All right, this concludes our video lecture on ionic bonding. This was Chapter 7, Section 2.